you have customers, your team has customers, whether they're external or internal. And today we're talking about service of those customers, something all leaders should think about. We're going to talk about it today. Are you ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to talk about leadership, teamwork, organizational culture, and human potential with experts from every walk of life. Your host is Kevin Eikenberry, a best-selling author and leadership thought leader for 25 years. This episode is sponsored by Kevin's book, The Long Distance Leader, Rules for Remarkable Remote Leadership. Order your copy today at remarkablepodcast.com forward slash book. And now, here's your host, Kevin. Welcome, everybody, to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We're glad you're here. Another episode, another accomplished guest. My guest today is Vicki Halsey. And if you're watching us, you may think she's a princess because of where she, because of the background. She is a princess, but that's really not in the bio. So let me tell you about uh, Dr. Victoria Halsey who is the vice president of vice president of applied learning for the Ken Blanchard companies. She partners with organizations to design and deliver programs that meet their needs through interactive workshops, keynotes, webinars, and lots more. She's the co-author of Blanchard's legendary service program and the award-winning situational leadership to blended learning, blended e-learning program. She's crafted the master of science in executive leadership graduate program for the University of San Diego. She has a couple of degrees from the University of San Diego, but she's also an author. She's written the legendary, excuse the book, Legendary Service, The Key is to Care, co-authored with Ken Blanchard and Kathy Cuff. We're going to talk about that today. She's also the, the author of Brilliance by Design, a great book about instructional design. She's the co-author of three other books, The Hamster Revolution, The Hamster Revolution for Meetings, and along with Ken Blanchard, Leading at a Higher Level, an all-inclusive reference to his leadership philosophies and teachings. Um, She does have a bachelor's degree from the University of California, Davis, and a couple of other degrees from the University of San Diego, which I already mentioned. She's accomplished. She's a princess. In the best case of the sense of the word. Listen, everybody, welcome. Vicki, welcome. I'm glad you're here, finally, to have have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. So excited to be here. You are the first person that I've called a princess on this show. Oh, thank you. It's good it's to all know. About, it's all about that background. For those of you that are only listening, if you would go to, you could, you could watch this and you'd see yeah. her, her husband has built her a castle. Um, just saying, and I didn't know this. This is new information to all of us. <laughs> right? So, um, so, so Vicki, I want to start with this. I mean, a lot of people who are listening, you know, um, have read, Ken Blanchard, know who Ken is. Um, and so they may be kind of going, wow. So I guess my first question is, so what's the backstory? How did you become a part? How did you, how did you find your way into being a part and now such an integral part of the Blanchard organization? Well, like 22 years ago, which I can't believe, um, I was finishing my doctorate at University of San Diego. I was teaching the master's capstone class So the final leadership class, and instead of teaching them about leadership, I had them go out and do leadership. They in teams had to think, someone should do something about this, and then they had to be the one. So they had to rally people, and I mean, it was unbelievable what went on in in, in San Diego during that class in terms of the, the leadership, stepping into their ability to lead, influence other, to create the changes they want in their communities. Anyhow, one of my students, was a VP at the Ken Blanchard companies. And he's like, you know what? You are our favorite professor. You know, he said, you know, there's this company up in Escondido. Escondido, I live in Escondido. All we do is leadership development. I was pregnant with my second son. I thought, what a neat time to to transition maybe. At the time I was, uh, um, you know, in charge of Chapman University's teaching and administrative credential programs. So I was training all the future teachers. So I hit Blanchard at a really neat time of influencing around teaching methodologies that help the participants feel brilliant instead of the facilitator feel brilliant. So I just hit it at the right time. I've been able to influence and teach all over the world since. 
Well, there you go. So now everyone, now you have the backstory. Uh, so you, you, you know, I know I mentioned the book Brilliance by Design and you just mentioned it again. You have a real heart for instructional design that's a big part of what you do, but that's really not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about two other areas of your expertise and those are uh, around leadership and customer service and how they intersect. And uh, so I, I do want to talk about the newest book, Legendary Service, uh, and the subtitle is The Key is to Care. And so let's start there. Um, Legendary service is a big statement. What is it? How would you define legendary service, Vicki? Yeah, it's consistently delivering the kind of service that makes people want to come back, that makes people feel like, wow, you care about me. You understand that customers fuel business and the relationships people have with their customers that's what keeps people coming back, is knowing someone cares. And I think legendary service means you actually get that, but it's not like you're just talking the talk. You really believe it, that that's what makes optimal living is, is when you can connect with other human beings in a way that meet their needs simultaneously with meeting your needs, which has to do with leadership and influence. Well, so the, the thing that I like about that response and is that I think sometimes some people might might hear legendary service and hear you say, well, it's about caring and think it's kind of all airy fairy and foo -foo, yeah. you know, Southern California, no disrespect. Yeah. But, the, but, the, but the point is that I, I think that your point is exactly right, that it's really about driving the business. And it happens yeah. to be that it's, it's bringing our heart to it that helps us do that. But the, but the hard business purpose underneath it is all there. Anything you want to add to that? point? Well, and I love what you're saying. I mean, the acronym CARE, C-A-R-E, means first of all, you're committed, committed to customers. Now, the interesting thing about what you just said in terms of bringing the heart, first of all, sometimes you hear customer service means you're all focused on the external customer. So we sort of start with the bullseye, which is you at the center of all your relationships. How are you caring for you? So you can turn around care for the people internally, the people that work with you and for you. And as leaders, are you modeling with your people the service you want your people to model with the customers? Do you care about them? And then flipping it so everybody feels like they have the resources, the energy, you think about today, you know, finding that energy to really meet the needs and wants of your external customers but I love what you said in such a way that they feel important. They feel like you really have their best interest at heart. And, um, and, and, they, and it's so different, Kevin, it's different that you go, huh, well, that was really cool. I'm going to tell everybody. Now your customers become your sales force. But also, I want to go back there. I want to have that feeling again. Because we're in a very wild and crazy time in our world right now where people have a lot of fear, they have worry, and what a neat thing to know. I'm going to go somewhere, I'm going to interact with somebody who's consistently, that's the word, going to make me feel important and cared for. So you know, when I think of legendary, so I'm, I want to come back to this idea that all of us, uh, everyone who's listening isn't necessarily a leader of a customer externally facing customer team. So I want to come back, talk a little bit more about yeah. that customer thing. Uh, even though you've, you've hinted at that, I want to come back to that. But I want to go back to this idea of legendary service. And, and I, I love, also love what you said, because some people might think about that. And then they think about a legendary story, like the guy at Nordstrom's taking back mm -hmm. the snow tire, even though they didn't sell tires and all that stuff. I love uh, it. Although it might be. The point is, like, doing this isn't about that thing. Right, exactly. it's not about creating a legend necessarily. Although enough of these things piled on themselves creates that. I mean, what you're describing, I think. Yeah, you know, Kathy Cuff, the co-author, tells a story about you know she's like me. You're facilitating all over the world. You get home, but then what? What happens? The family, right? Everybody wants you yeah. to do. Woo! You've been gone, so you now need to kick into hyperdrive. But anyway, she's, you know, she just landed. She stops, picks up pizzas on the way home. She's like talking, okay, here. And she's, you know, obviously juggling 10 different things. She gets up to the counter. The person gives her a glass of water and says, wow, looks like you have a wild and crazy day going. And then gets the pizza and takes it. But I mean, just giving a glass of water. But what did it show? You think of all the variables that were in place 
to allow that service provider to, to step away, get a glass of water, serve the customer, mention the fact that she's actually been attentive, that's the A in the care model, you know, and notice, but also could be responsive, that's the R, and she was empowered, that's the E, because of C, her commitment to what she does and the good she can do in the world, you know, being a cashier at a pizza parlor. Well, and, you know, okay, so I was going to have you walk through all of those <laughs> models, and we still will um, yeah. a little bit more, but the point is that it required that person to be, uh, I love the word, the attentive word, the observant yeah. idea, uh, and, and, and I want to come back, I, I do want to come back specifically to the culture one, but before mm -hmm. we do that, I want to go back to this. I'm, uh, I'm a leader of a team, an internal team. Uh, yep. And, you know, we don't, we're not customer facing. And like, I get all this, if, mm -hmm. if I'm a leader in customer service, if I'm a leader in, if I'm a leader in, um, you know, in, you know, in manufacturing services, if I'm in the sales sure. organization, but like, how did really, is this what I ought to be focused on if I have an internal accounting team? Well, and Kevin, think about that. Think about, just picture two different internal accounting teams. Okay, picture one. That's not where, hard, by the way. I was huh? with a couple of them yesterday. No, that's not hard. Go ah, ahead. But you know, we're one team is like we're all doing our work. We're striving to do our own thing. We want to be the best at what we do, you know, but they're self-focused. They're I'm trying to get my work done. Okay, that's great. What about the other team where not only am I trying to get my work done, but I look up, I acknowledge the people around me. We have meetings where we discuss best practices. We leverage and pool organizational intelligence with each other because we realize the more we connect with each other, the stronger we are to do the best possible work that we do because it really is about energy management. I mean, are we energizing the people around us or are we draining the people around us, you know? And you think about that attentiveness, which is I want to be an energizer. I want to be someone that creates an environment where we care about each other, where we look up, we say hi to each other. We really do the kinds of things, you know, where you think about building relationships because relationships is what life's all about. Relationships are what make going to work fabulous. I remember Talent Keepers data said, you know, what keeps people coming back? Hey, it's the peers you get to work with. That's exactly you know, right. people that make you excited about who you are, catching people doing things right. That's another thing under the responsiveness. Absolutely. So, you know, we're having this conversation, and if all plays out the way I think it will, yeah. you will be episode number 127 of it. And in episode number two, uh, yeah. we had, I, if you were watching, you might, saw me look away just for a second. In episode number two, we had on John Gordon, who uh, wrote oh, I love Energy him. Bus. You're talking about Energy Bus stuff, Energy Vampires, and all that stuff. It's super important stuff. And the reason I make that comment is, even though that isn't the only thing that he and I talked about way back in episode number two, Right. But but if if you resonate with what Vicky was just saying, I really would recommend John's work, uh, especially the energy bus, although there's certainly other great stuff he's written, but it really does connect. So I love this idea. And and as you're talking about those two are our, our two accounting teams, right? Yep. One of them's getting work done, uh, but their their focus is internal, as you said, and not only internal to themselves, but at a minimum internal to that team. And they're not thinking about who that those accounting reports are going to or who else is using them or the credit department or the comptroller or any of those things. And so they are a silo. So here's the other thing. People that are listening may say, well, we got silos, Kevin. I mean, we got people over here that are sub-optimizing their work and they're wearing the accounting t-shirt and they're wearing the manufacturing t-shirt. And so I'm saying that if you're listening to Vicki, if you've got silos, they need to be thinking about what you're talking about because that's yeah. the way to help turn us out and start to look beyond ourselves. You know, it's interesting. One of my favorite, uh, you know, initiatives that we did with Fannie Mae was 100% internal customer service. And it's how is legal working with pricing? How are we, you know, it's truly what they did was that customer segment activity, which is part of the core of attentiveness. It's serving people the way they want to be served. I mean, a concrete example is every time I teach this, I'm reminded about my internal customers. And I think about- And you're, I, if you're like I, me, you're convicted, like, oh crap. Yes. How am I really I doing with here? Custom. Yeah, and how does custom want me to work with them? Well, one of them 
says, I can't hear all the changes. Sometimes you leave me a voicemail with the changes. That doesn't work for me. I need you to email me a list so I can check them off. Well, brilliant, I need to do that. But another one's completely auditory. She says, oh no, just leave me a message with what you want. I don't like reading all that. I just wanna be able to have the document up and make the changes as I hear them. So our shift of being responsive in the way someone wants us to be responsive is really critical. And I think at Fannie Mae, it was so neat to have them understand, you know, being attentive means noticing what's gonna help someone do their job better for us. You see, it's a symbiotic relationship. Absolutely. And so every, it's an everybody, it's a double win yeah. kind of thing, right? So we're really probably a triple win because what, we got the two relationships yeah. and then we got, maybe it's four, because then you got the organization, then you got the, the, the paying customer. So yeah. um, talking with Vicki Halsey about the book, Legendary Service, The Key is to Care, and you briefly whipped through the care model in the book you talked about. And by the way, uh, for those of you that have read any of Ken's books, you know that Ken writes parables and uh, business novels, however, whatever you want to call them. And uh, that's what this book is. So if you're wondering, that's this book. It's a easy to read, get you through it. But the whole, uh, there's a core content within it and it's five components. You've mentioned some of them. So walk us back through each of those and then I want to talk about one of them a little bit more, but walk us back through that if you would. Oh, great. Well, as you think about the I care model, first of all, we want to have a vision of what ideal service is. And Kevin, as you think of service, think about it everywhere you go, okay, from calling about your phone to going to a restaurant, going to the store, retail, et cetera. What would you say is the average level of service you receive? Below average. <laughs> Right? So I mean, what, what you get is what you get is a serviceable service. Is what you Love get. that. Yeah. So that's what I hear everywhere I go. Whether it's a keynote for a thousand people and I have them show a show of hands, pretty much threes, fours, fives, occasionally sixes. Hey, what does that say? Let's think about today with social media. When are people going to pop? Are they going to say, "Ooh, I, you know, man, I had a five in terms of." <laughs> You know, they're not going to write anything. When are people going to write? When they get a nine or a 10 or what? A mm -hmm. one or a two. Yeah. 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 So ideal yeah. service means what would it think? And, and by the way, anyone who's listening, you guys think of the opportunity with thousands and thousands and thousands of people saying, you know, I get a, I get a five in terms of service. What would a nine or 10 be like for our customers? What would it be like for our internal customers? What if I were serving myself at the level of a nine or a 10, so I have the energy to serve my peers and turn around and serve customers? So that literally is taking some time to think about what would ideal service be? And then C is creating that culture, a culture of service, which means we don't miss any opportunity we can to serve, to listen, to really understand What's our vision around service? Now think about this, Kev, when we worked with the San Diego Padres, when they opened up Pet Petco Park here in San Diego, yeah. 3,500 guest service providers. That's a lot of people to learn about legendary service. Well, when they, and this is great activity for everyone listening to do, when we work with their senior leaders and we ask them, you know, when you think about your customer service vision, what business are you in? And they said, we're in the sports entertainment business. Yeah, no, that doesn't rally anyone to do, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like if I'm taking tickets, serving drinks, do I throw your drink at you and hope you catch it? You know, sports, no, no, no. But when they walked out, what business were they in? The major league memory business. So a culture of service now was created because 7,000 people, sent a Major League Memory story to the, the website majorleaguememories.net that we created literally that day in the session. So everyone listening, get some customer service vision that everyone can relate to and know, ah, this is what I'm supposed to do as I think about serving the customers. Because then the culture of service happens when they write their personal service vision. And then A is attentiveness to yourself, to your internal customers, it's knowing who your internal customer segments are, mm -hmm. who are your external customer segments, and then doing some mapping in terms of what do they need, what do they want, what could I teach them 
So creating these documents, maybe on flip charts, do a different segment at every team meeting, right? And then yep. what's the R? Responding in the way someone wants to have you respond to them. I noticed that you I noticed that you're harried. Let me get you some water, right? Oh my gosh, being responsive though is so tricky. It's not tricky if you're responding in the way you always like to respond. But I remember teaching a class one time early on when our training program first came out and I'm like, so imagine you go to a coffee shop. Imagine Kevin and they go, hey Kevin, do you want your caramel macchiato? And you're like, woo, they know me, they know what I want. Some guy in the class goes, I hate that. <laughs> well, why is that a gift? That was a gift for everyone in the class because what did he want for legendary service? Just quietly look up at me and say, can I help you? <laughs> and let me go, I want black coffee. Give me my black coffee and let me go on my way. I'm not a morning person. <laughs> Love that, but Kevin, that's why responsiveness is so tricky. It's responding in a way that people want. Plus, there's a lot of neuroscience behind responsiveness, about creating the neural connections and the neural pathways to the experience you want people to remember. And you get, know, because of your background, the amygdala, right? It's memory and emotions are stored in the same place. So you want to create a lasting memory of care, you need to trigger the emotions that cause those memories of care and acknowledge any pain points someone's had to yeah. get rid of them so it leaves a lasting memory of care. And lastly, by the way, the E is empowerment. Are you taking the power that you have to serve at the highest level? Because I hear all the time, well, we can't do anything about that. But the question, everyone that's listening, you wanna change that, Anytime you hear someone say, right, just put this on the wall, put a big line through, someone should do something about that, or we can't, to what can we? What yeah, that's, the, that's the accountable question, right? It's saying, yeah. I'm going to take something, right? Absolutely. So yeah. I got to tell, tell a quick story about responsiveness. I gotta tell, yeah, I it. it struck me as you were telling that. So um, years ago, I, was, I, I spent a lot of time and, in Houston and stayed a lot at the Four Seasons. It's beautiful. Uh, I love that. Houston. And I would go into the lounge oftentimes in the evening and got to know the servers. I was there often enough and they knew which kind of beverage I wanted. And they would come to the point where they would just look at me and I'd nod and they would bring it. I mean, it was just, <laughs> and they would bring it. It was awesome. Then one night I was in there with a group of people and I was at the head of the table and it was clear this is the group of people that I was with and they did not do that. They came and asked me what I wanted. So see how wonderful that was? They were attentive to say, he may not want all these people to know he's been here enough for us to know what he wants. Oh, interesting. Isn't that great? It's yeah. A great, it's a great story about people being observant and attentive and thinking and then going from there, right? Now, in, in the end, it wouldn't have mattered, but it was such a wonderful message to me and I talked with them about it later and we just talked uh, talked about it and they they did exactly what you said they were they were aware they were responsive and they went from there and they, and they brought their choice. brains to they, work they brought their brains to work they were empowered to do that right they had exactly. a supervisor that encouraged them it may have been who they are but they also had to have something that's the thing I want to talk about just briefly you've talked about it quite a bit but this idea of the culture of service you've talked about yeah. stuff to identify it and codify it and all that sort of stuff but I want you to talk about that, just one more coda on that for me as a mid-level, front-level leader and who is maybe saying, that's really great. I wish all of our folks had that. What's your couple word message to them for their team, even if the organization's not doing what you described? You know, it's your circle of influence. It's, it's you being the one who says, we're going to be about service. We're gonna be about serving each other. And by the way, I get a lot of feedback when I teach. They're like, you really walk your talk. I mean, I greet people as they walk in. I, I ask them how they're doing, what do they do? You know, I'm not fiddling with my PowerPoint or anything like that. I am all about them. They have, you know how they have little snacks? I clear their plates. You know, I walk around when they take the shrink wrap or whatever off, I pick it all up. But, it's, a, it's an interesting thing for leaders. Are you modeling? Oh, I remember at Wells Fargo one time with the bank presidents, the senior leader, we went to the Federal Reserve Bank in Cleveland 
What was so cool on the bus? The most senior leader had a basket. It was like 110, swear to goodness. We were all like, Bleh. but anyhow, walking up and down the aisle with ice cold bottles of water in a basket and little snacks. Now, what does that say? We're gonna create a culture of leadership. And, and kind of like that book, Hope is Not a Strategy, it's the same with this. You have to put this as your strategy and then build out a plan for doing it. Literally, how am I gonna be the one that inspires everybody to create that culture? How am I gonna call it out? Every time someone does something that goes right down the runway of what we're trying to achieve. Right on. So I'm going to, because I sort of opened with your mm -hmm. backstory uh, and how you got to the Blanchard organization. I, again, I know there's a lot of folks um, who have a connection to or have read Ken. I'm going to ask you this question. It relates to the, to the, to the other book as well. But my question is this, what's, what is a leadership lesson that you've learned in working closely with Ken? Uh, well, Ken's favorite one is catch people doing things right. You know, and I think that there is such science behind that, Kevin, in terms of, you know, I mean, he used to say people who feel good about themselves produce good results, but he realized it's also the flip side. People who produce good results feel good about themselves. Yeah, it's and an upward spiral. Both are true. It is. And I think those two messages kind of weave together. We want to help people be successful. So what does that mean? Now there's a lot of neuroscience again behind Ken's teachings, which is when you, let's say you're, you're new to the organization, you need to learn some new things. Well, well, a leader wants to catch you doing things right. Hey, I noticed you did this, boom, boom, boom. Now when you do that, that may be an area you're not doing quite as well. You wanna redirect. You don't want to tell people what not to do because you are actually myelinating and sending the energy to the brain of what you don't want them to do. Don't hesitate to call. Don't huh? hesitate to call. Huh? Don't hesitate to call, right? Exactly, I mean, yes. Everyone immediately stops and say, well, they don't really want me to call. Absolutely. So it's what do you want people doing, okay? And keep them moving in that direction. Now, what's funny is obviously my brain is on fire in terms of when you talk about leadership and influence, but the idea there is, as leaders, are we catching people doing things right in a way that we are saving documents? I mean, you think about your accounting team. Are there documents where people have done such a great job that you could cleanse the name, but give it to a learner and say, here's what a good job looks like? You know, because people are so visual these days. They can't hear, but yet how do all leaders teach? You need to do this, you need to do that, blah, 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 blah. Exactly, and it goes, what the? People can only listen, you know, five, 10 seconds. <laughs> so I think Ken's messages are so timely in terms of how we need to help people succeed. But then Kevin, you, felt, you forward that to customers. Our, my, my husband was all excited this year because the tax guy praised him. He said, you're one of the best people I work with because you keep such meticulous notes and they're so organized that it helps me, you know, really do a great job for you. So I think Ken's messages of, of acknowledging what people do that that's good, not only has them feeling good, but it keeps increasing their ability to do the great work they'd like to do. That's awesome. So we're going to shift now, everyone, for the long-term listeners. We're going to do the fast break. And the fast break is brought to you by our new book, The Long Distance Leader. If you want to learn more about leading at a distance and having more successful remote teams, go to Long Distance Leader Book. Dot com. Now, so Vicki, what I have for you are three words and I'm going to give you a word and I just want you to give us your first reaction. What, you know, like fast break, short <laughs> thought about them. I know I'm notice I'm saying that extra for you because it's easy for you to say a lot. So, exactly. fast break, okay? so here they are. I have three words for you. Are you ready? I'm ready. First word is selling. Ooh, selling the opportunity to influence. All right. This is, see, you're perfect at this. The second word is coaching oh coaching holding people accountable to what they actually want to do and setting parameters for them and targets and helping redirect them so they achieve what they want to achieve all right and the last one which we've talked about in a variety of ways today is change ah change 
<laughs> change is ever constant, but it's important to know that <laughs> the better you understand what change is, the more you understand every time a change happens, you can go down the learner path or you can go down the crabby person path. So the idea <laughs> is to go down the learner path. What can I learn about this versus I, you know, getting all agitated. So change is a gift. The way that I taught that to my daughter when she was, I don't know, nine, was I said, Kelsey, you have two choices. You can be a whiner or you can be a winner. So there you go. Oh, that's beautiful. There you go, a whiner or a winner. So that's a, that's a, that's a simpler way of saying being a victim or being accountable, which is really ah. exactly what you're saying, right? So yeah. um, you're doing all this stuff and you live in a castle. Oh my you're gosh. All this, all this stuff. So what what is it, Vicki, that you do? for fun? What do you do for fun? Oh my gosh. Well, I am a diver. I don't know if you know that. Boing, boing on the diving board. Uh, I have been diving my whole life and uh, I still compete. And I, really? I did uh, know that. Yeah, love it. Uh, I, I think that's just a really fun hobby. I like making beads. I like hanging out with friends. I, uh, I don't cook like ever. No one would want to eat my food. Um, but I love to read. I love to uh, sing, believe it or not. Well, I'm not going to ask you to sing, but I am going to ask you about reading. And so what is something that you've read recently or that people you think might find interesting that you've read? Oh, I just, you know, I love reading about different, like the owner's manual to the brain. That's a really neat one. Great from books. Howard. The reason yeah. I love that, I'm about to teach my class down at USD, and that's one of the textbooks, so I thought I'd refresh myself on it. But the owner's manual to the brain is like four inches thick. Every chapter, a different aspect of what we could know about the brain. And what's neat for you, Kevin, as someone who, you know, designs and teaches and everything else, the last part of every chapter is like in blue, which means what can we do with that information? Absolutely. It's a great book. I highly recommend it to all of you, the, the owner's manual for the brain. But I think there's another thing you've read recently that you wanted to tell us about too. Oh, yes, The Shift. And what's really neat about this, Kimberly White, it's a brand new Barrett Kohler book. Um, what's interesting is I, I just found that from the Barrett Kohler newsletter because my books are, are you know, published by Barrett Kohler. And what's interesting about our model being care, this woman was studying, um, she was asked to write a story about, you know, how did these nursing homes become basically world renowned for caring? And, and what was interesting was, as she was trying to codify what people do, what she realized was what was important to her in her life is that caring about the people you care about and being cared about by the people you care about. And she realizes she kind of, the book changed from here's how to make everybody care to here's the shifts that happened in me when I realized this is the life I want. This is the life that makes me feel, you know, feel the way I want to feel in my life. It's like Gandhi's quote, find yourself by losing yourself in the right. service of others. There you go. Awesome. So um, we have been talking with you all throughout this. We've been talking a lot about the book, Legendary Service, but there's a lot more as we talked about at the front end. So how can people learn more about you, Vicki, and your work and the writing and all that stuff? Where, where do you want to point people? Well, there's a couple different places. If you're interested in things like the brilliance by design, like how do I, and by the way, it's not just run a training. It's how do I run a meeting, my hour meeting, and use what I call as the engage model to really engage people. I mean, how many people, I mean, how many people do you know go, woohoo, I have a, you know, I have six meetings today. Eh, you know, but what if every one of those meetings your peers were teaching, there were activities that had you really actually learn something and apply something and have problem solving models that you really made progress on what's important for your organization. So all the free resources, video on that, all free on vickihalsey.com, plus blogs and all sorts of other things. Now, kenblanchard.com, there's all sorts of videos from Ken in terms of optimal leadership, in terms of legendary service from me, Kathy Cuff, the amazing co-author. If you want, you know, let's say you want to bring us in for some kind of workshop, kenblanchard.com. Just go on there. You can 
you know, get the books, you can get the training. It's a really, I don't know, I just, I'm so excited about the, you know, I, I can even just say this. One of my favorite quotes is, people don't describe what they see, they see what they can describe. And I think with this care model, all of a sudden, because people have had a little bit of time out of their busy work to focus on customer service, mm -hmm. take care of themselves, their internal customers, and then their external customers, it's life changing. It's creating places where people can thrive. All right. So all of you now know why I've been looking forward to having Vicki on the show. So Vicki, thank you so much for being here. But before we go, I've got to ask the question of all of the rest of you. You've been listening and now I'm asking you the two word question I always ask you, which is now what? What action yeah. are you going to take from today? There's something, there's probably a lot that you got today, but there's something that you got today that would make a difference for you, make a difference for your team, but it won't happen if you don't take action. And so my challenge to you, and I, I believe our, both of our urging to you would be to take some action, but first you got to decide what that's going to be. So now what? Otherwise, this was just entertainment. We'd like it for, be, for it to be about application a whole lot more than that. So Vicki, thanks again for being here. Thanks for spending the time with me this morning. We finally got this put together. I'm so Woo. glad you got it done. Thank you, Kevin. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I will. And everybody else, we're here every week. And so you Woo. ought to come back. If you haven't been here before, you now know what you've been missing. And if you want to join us starting today, we're here every week right here on the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. Thanks, everyone.